Hey, I'm Pastor Mike, and thank you so much for taking time to check out this message. And I hope that it inspires you. I hope it pushes you either towards a relationship with Jesus or further along in your relationship with Jesus. But we would never want this message to replace the reality of what it means to be involved with a local church. Although I'm excited that you're checking this out and I, and I hope it speaks to you, let me encourage you that you need to be involved in a local body. There's something to the fact that you need to be under the authority of the spiritual lead of a pastor and involved in a community that can push you uh, further along. We are meant to be in community. So enjoy this message, but let me encourage you to be seeking an opportunity to be involved with a local church. Be a man. Be tough. Be sweet. No one likes us smarty pants. Don't be such a sissy. Handle it like a man. You should go on a diet. Play the field. Be sexy, but not too sexy. Show him who's boss. You're a princess. You make the money. Let him take care of you. Pick yourself up. Know your place. Keep your mouth shut. The world tells us who we're supposed to be, but it keeps changing its mind. Throughout time, throughout cultures, we can't decide what makes a man a man and what makes a woman a woman. The message, the plan, it keeps changing. But what if there was something else? What if there was something better? Something that existed since the beginning. Something untouched by time. Something true and perfect. Let me jump in. We're deep into this series now called A Beautiful Design. And it's all about manhood and womanhood, right? Manhood and womanhood. We're going to talk a little bit about the struggles of a woman today. Um, and Jen and I have had a, a fun time going through this whole process and getting it prepared. But I want to open up with this. Here's, here's what I want to say. The first thing that we've got to get in our mind, and this is your first fill in on your notes there. It says, in order for life to work, in order for your life to work, let the one who designed it define it. Let the one who designed it define it. And what I mean by that is there's not a person on the planet that doesn't battle with something in the Bible, right? There, there's something in the Bible you don't like, okay? So for me, I do not like the verse that says, turn the other cheek. That's a, God, that's a dumb verse. I, I'm just, can, you know, can I be that honest? Like if somebody spits in my face like they did in Jesus' face, I'm going to knock their front teeth out. Or that's what I'm thinking, right? right? And, and I, and I kind of joke with that. But honestly, we get to a point where we have to understand if we're going to call ourselves a Christian, what that means is that means taking the whole Bible, not taking any pieces out, but taking the whole Bible, even the parts that we don't like, right? And we can't do this thing where we go, well, I know the Bible says this, but I just feel that. We can't do that. We have to let the designer define life. And so we've been talking about manhood and womanhood from the standpoint of what does the Bible say about it, as opposed to all these weird things that we've got going on in our community today. So manhood, let me quick review. I don't have time to go back through it all. I'm going to hit some highlights. If some of this, you kind of go, what? It's back. Go back and watch. Go back and watch the series. But I want to hit some highlights just so we know where we are in the process. Manhood. Manhood, being male doesn't make you a man. Can I get an amen? Right? Just because you have a little boy at your house and he's maybe eight or 10, well, guess what? He's not a man, right? He's male, but he's not a man. So manhood is not defined by sex. Man manhood is not defined or woman is not de defined by plumbing. You, you understand? There's a design. There's something that God designed. And what we learned when we studied this was the word is headship, headship. That's the, that's the design that God gave for, for manhood. And we define it this way. Headship is the unique calling that of, of a man to establish order so that all flourish. The last part of that is so important. So that all flourish, right? Not just the man flourishes. Now we made two statements also. These two statements, one is where biblical manhood flourishes, so does everything else. And number two, where biblical manhood is absent, there is pain and suffering. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're an atheist, an agnostic, you think Buddha's got it going on, whatever. You cannot argue with those two statements. Because whether you're a sociologist or an economist, whatever it is, government, 
every study out there, everything shows that these two statements are so true. Where, right, where, where men are men, things go well. And where men refuse to enter the space that God created for them to walk into, things just don't work out. Go into any lower income neighborhood, anywhere on the planet, and you will see two things. One is fatherless homes, and two, women are consumed. Here's what I mean by that. Women become playthings or they're exploited rather than seen as having the image of God inside of them. And so we get the objectification of women, right? So when we look at music or music videos these days, right? We don't have a bunch of men twerking on the videos. We have women, right? We have a scenario where you have to understand that's a breakdown of the understanding of who a woman is that we objectify and we turn her into an object. And you see that. And so we talked about now men... Because of the curse, we have two specific buckets that we talked about where our sin, all of our sin falls as men. One was selfish passivity. In other words, I as a man will just go, Jen's coming at me and this, and she's got that, and I just go, oh, okay. And I turn around and I walk the other way. I I don't want to deal with this. I'm right. Selfish passivity that I, whatever, turn on the remote. You know, what's the quickest way to get the man out of a bathroom? Turn off the Wi-Fi. I go hide in the bathroom, right? Kind of scenario. Uh, Come on, you know that's true. Um, This this passivity thing. But the other side, the other bucket where men's sinful nature falls is in selfish aggression. And now we get to the extreme of that is abuse. The The extreme of that scenario. And so men have a tendency in our sinful nature to fall into those two categories when it comes to how we are interacting with the opposite sex and how we're dealing on a daily basis. It's selfish passivity or it's selfish aggression. And neither of those is the way that God wants us to be, right? So last week we started defining the role of a woman. And we use Genesis 2 and 18 and it says this, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And all the women said, amen. Right. Um, I will make a helper suitable for him. And we concentrated on that word helper. In the original language, it is azer. Azer. And we talked about last week, helper, that term just makes you think of the help, right? Like, okay, maid, inferior, like because of the word, because of the way we typically use that word helper. But we defined it last week and said, that's not the definition at all. As a matter of fact, that word is used over and over again in the scripture to describe God as a helper to his people. Is God weak? Is God inferior? No, the one who helps is actually stronger than the one being helped. If you need help, it's because you don't have the bandwidth to handle it by yourself, right? And so we raised up the idea of the thought that these are warrior helpers, that we're to be in battle together, shoulder to shoulder. Jen, Jen is not inferior because her role is as the helper, but she is shoulder to shoulder. And there are times, and we said this, headship doesn't always mean leadership, right? We said, in other words, when there is a PMS meltdown going on at the Matheny household, guess who's leading that? I'm not touching that one with a 10-foot pole, right? I'm in the background going, "Mm, go get them, tiger, right? But listen to me, the reality of us working together, and so the helper helps in that scenario. But our problem is our normal broken sinful state causes us to go, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it my own way, right? And so in the beginning, they ate the apple because they wanted to do it their own way, and now we've seen the curse. The curse we've seen on men is selfish passivity or selfish aggression. Today, we're going to talk about the curse that we see on women. I believe, listen to me, ladies. Open your heart right now. Don't push back because Jen will tell you when we first started doing one of these, she kind of pushed back a little bit. And then she started recognizing it in herself almost every day. Let me ask you to open your heart right now. Men, pay attention. It's going to help you understand ladies a little bit better. Um, which is a challenge, right? To say the least, right? For us, it is. We don't know. We're, we are so dumb. We're just looking at y'all going, I don't know. Can we eat now? But anyway, this is going to help you if you pay attention. But ladies, listen to me. If you will push in on this a little bit and not go, I don't think that's me. Push in a little bit. Push in a little bit and challenge yourself to look in the mirror a little bit. Let's look at what happens when God puts the curse on the woman. Genesis 3 and 16. To the woman, he said, 
I will make your pain and childbearing very severe with painful labor. You will give birth to children. If you have given birth to a child, please stand up right now. Come on, give them a hand. Give them a hand, everybody. You can give them a better hand than that, right? Right? Look, 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 ladies, we give you all honor. You can sit down. Thank you. I just wanted to honor you for a second uh, because I don't, I, that's one of the moments when I am so grateful to be a man. And I'm so grateful for adoption. Woo! This is true. This is true. Right? Listen, sin enters the cosmos. Pain and death comes to us all is the story. And in the middle of our distinctive identities, men and women, there's differences of how this sin is going to carry out, the curse is going to carry out. So we've already studied with men, it's going to be toil, strife, hard work, right? That, that's the, these are the words that are used. But with woman, it is pain and childbearing <laughs> and having to deal with a man, right? But bigger than the physical, I need you to hear something else. Because sin distorted the external expectations of a woman, but it also infected the very heart and hope of a woman as well. Listen to the rest of that verse in verse 16. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Now, lots of theological arguing over what this means. The first place that people usually go is domination. That sounds like he's going to, uh, the domination argument. I don't think that's what it is at all. The more I studied it, let me help you this way. Let me switch one word to help you to understand what I think this means. We're going to pull out husband and we're going to put in God. It reads like this. Your desire shall be for your God and he shall rule over you. That's what it's supposed to be. Your desire, where you find your source, where you find your rest, where you find those things. But now guess what? That's going to get shifted, and you're going to have this desire towards your husband. Why do we have so many little girls that are dying to find a man? Because the desire has been shifted away from God, but yeah. to man. And this is where I'm supposed to come in, but I feel the need go. to go a little off script. Here. Do it. Um, one, it's been a long time since I've been in church. I get in church about once a quarter. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing in children's church. But when I do come to church, it's usually the kids up here doing fifth Sunday family worship. So it's been a long time since I've seen worship team. Oh my gosh, you guys sound so good. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, major props to the worship team. That was really awesome. And I, you know, have been sweating bullets all week long. I'm scared to death. Joe Reagan, usher man's trying to hand me a bottle of water. I'm like, Joe, I can't drink water on stage. He's like, just take it, you'll need it. So I'll pick up the water bottle and be like, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that. You know, I'm not gonna do that. So I'm terrified. And then I realize Miss Tara's gotta be one half preacher man, one half music woman. And those, um, that preaching you did about Jesus conquering fear was all for me. So thank you for that little sermon. I appreciate that. So I am terrified. So <laughs> just so you know that. But okay, now back to this. Because like like Michael said, our desire should be for our God. And instead, a lot of times our desire, our craving, our longing, our longing is often misplaced. The curse is not that women want to dominate the men in our lives. That's not usually what I struggle with. Our problem is that we worship the men in our lives. Now pump the brakes. I know what you're thinking. Just hear me. We worship them because we look to them for affirmation. We look to them to provide for us emotionally. And we look to them to provide for us spiritually the things that really God alone is supposed to provide for us. That's right. Our problem isn't that we want to dominate. Our problem is idolatry. Mm. I know that's hard, but hang with me. But if you think the foundational result of the fall of man in the average woman's life is that we want to dominate, you're missing the vast majority of at least my problems. Um, I know my fair share of dominating, manipulative, control freakish women. You do? <laughs> yeah, me. Um, but our problem actually goes way deeper. It's 
we're idols, we're setting up right. idols, you know, right. not looking to God. Right. Because oftentimes we look to men to meet a need they can't meet. Emotional needs, spiritual needs, physically. And instead, hmm. instead of recognizing our sovereign God to meet these needs, uh, we, once the men don't meet those needs, we start looking to ourselves. And we start turning inward and looking to ourselves to provide for ourselves financially. I can bring home the bacon and I can fry it up in a pan. I don't need no man. Wait, that's not how it goes. But, you know, that's what happens when we start, when the men in our lives disappoint us. We start looking to ourselves. Mm. So the control tactics uh, that, you, that we sometimes battle with, em emotional, um, emotional manipulation, straight up manipulation, they don't come from the desire to dominate the men in our lives. We resort to these tactics because we've longed too hard to find rest and peace and fulfillment in the men in our lives. And that's not where we're supposed to do that. We whine, lead me spiritually, provide for me physically, affirm me emotionally. And when the men can't or they don't, then we try to do that ourselves. Yeah. And we, it's not that we need to change our desires or our craving, that God put that in us. We just simply need to change the object of those desires and cravings. Yeah, and we stink at it, ladies. I mean, if you haven't figured that out yet, if you're expecting us to provide your emotional needs, we suck. <laughs> Come on, somebody, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, so really, like, when you think about you're setting yourself up for disaster, like if Jennifer Matheny looks at this man to fulfill emotional needs, she's going to be wanting. I mean, really, right? And yet do that. So when you think about this, this shift and this curse of your desire being for the man and you start thinking about our culture and the way we do things and this chasing for, most women set up men as idols and look to them to provide these things. And it's only God that can provide those things. And so it's a, it's a disaster. Apart from Christ, listen to this. Apart from Christ, men oppressed women in return. Think about it. If you got women that are looking and saying, oh, com you, com you complete me, Jerry Maguire, for those of you who are old, right? This kind of a deal, right? Well, then men turn around and in their sin for nature, they take advantage of that. So do you, you see the cycle? You see the unhealthy cycle and we see it play out in our culture. Um, w women will, will want a man. This is, this is every romantic comedy. Right? Every romantic comedy is right here in the text. I need a man to satisfy me. I need a man to fill me. I need a man to complete me. Um, I need someone to, to help me. Uh, but, but ladies, let's talk in large about how this plays out. Because I think you're going to see two specific things we're going to talk about this morning. That, that, that this plays out. That I think you can take the sinful nature, the sinful behaviors that you have as a, as a woman... And, and you could put them in one of two buckets. So we gave the guys two buckets of selfish passivity and selfish aggression. We're going to give you two buckets today. Number one is this, comparison. Comparison. Let me define comparison. Comparison is the disordered desire for approval and validation. The disordered desire for approval and and validation. Now, guys, pay attention and stay in here. I know we're talking about the ladies, but if you'll pay attention here, it's going to help you to understand uh, how to deal with uh, the women in your life much, much better, I promise. So Julia Oliphant is a secular writer. She writes for the, uh, the Telegraph in, in the UK. And she wrote an article entitled, Why Do Girls Check Out Other Girls? Let me read you a quote from it. Like it or not, we're guilty of it. Be it an inconspicuous glance at the girl browsing the same clothing shop window as you, or the rather more blatant stare at the girl sitting opposite you on the tube or the subway. We just can't seem to help ourselves. And a recent study has confirmed it. Women spend more time checking out each other than they do the opposite sex. It's comparison. Also, according to Dr. Caroline Walters, a body image and women's sexuality spiritual, uh, a specialist, it's not just other women's clothing, but she says this, quote, it's practically every aspect of another woman's appearance, from hairstyle to tan, shape, size, even body hair and fat distribution. Whatever we deem to be most important ourselves, we check out in other women. 
That's true. A woman then becomes enslaved. Listen to me. A woman becomes enslaved by comparing intellect, beauty, body composition, style, fashion. In fact, here's another quote from the previous article. Women actually dress for other women. They don't dress for men at all. I found that to be fascinating. Like, I, j I just thought about when I was thinking about that whole thing and this comparison thing. But it's not just there, ladies. We also compare in uh, parenting, right? That's why we have mommy wars. You ever watch, like, Dance Moms on TV or something? Right, right, kind of a thing. And we have mommy wars. And we laugh at them, but actually do we do some of the same things just on a lesser, on a daily basis, right? I have my hand raised. Mommy right. shaming? I have my hand raised. My, my you have a story? Yes. I have, Tell your story. My hand's raised. Okay, so my kids do speech and debate. And one of the speech and debate mommies sent a graduation announcement for her senior to our house. Uh, we opened up the graduation announcement. It was killer. Uh, it was a trifold, glossy, it, front and back. It listed all of her senior's accomplishments, her grades, her scholarships, her goals. And the kicker was her daughter was going to Princeton. Yeah, and I was like, oh, that's great. That's just great. Her kid's going to Princeton. My senior's a chicken slinger at Rural King. Fabulous. Chicken slinger. She she sells chickens at Rural King. It's yeah. chicken slinger. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was just fuming on the inside, like, oh man, this is terrible. This is just <laughs> terrible. And then what snapped me out of it, my poor sweet daughter probably sensed it, and she was like, Mom, I'm sorry I didn't make it to Princeton. <sighs> I know, and I snapped out of it. I'm like. I looked at her and I said, are you kidding? I'm glad you're not going to Princeton. One, we can't afford it, but <laughs> most importantly, because that's not God's will for your life. Right. God's got a purpose and a destiny for you. Princeton right. ain't in it, and that's okay. I only want what's best, what, what God wants yeah. for my kid. And yeah. if Princeton ain't in the books, that's fine. I just want what God wants for her. Yeah, this is, this is comparison, right? Um, you know, if she, one's a good mom, you have to be a better mom. Right. Right? Type yeah. of scenario. Yeah, or I've, I've heard ladies say like, oh, this guy at work, he pursues me. I wish my husband pursued me that way. And, you know, all this comparison stuff, we, we are partly programmed to do it. It's, it's only natural to compare yourself because it does give you a point of reference, which can be reassuring. But at the end of the day... Comparison is competition. Yep. What you're comparing and what we're competing for is identity. We want to have an identity. It's like that desire that he was talking about for approval and acceptance and validation. But that is an identity gone bad. It's a false identity. That false identity has a false strength and a false, I have it all together. And that has us constantly comparing, constantly trying to better ourselves. But this is not based on any universal biblical standard, right. but actually by the standards of our current age, our current culture. We have to be that, we have to look like this, we have to accomplish that. It's all, well most of it anyway, is way out of step with biblical standard. And this comparison leads to dark, dark, dark places. Dark places. Uh, let's talk about dark places. Let's talk about social media. Because social media is destroying our ladies. Here's what I mean. Back in the day, it used to be Cosmo. You remember Cosmo Magazine? How did you get Cosmo Magazine? You had to go to the store and buy it, right? It, it wasn't easily accessible. Whereas right now today, it's in your hand, in your face every single day, right? What is the... What is the worst possible thing that you can do for somebody who's battling comparison? Well, let's just be evil geniuses for a moment. Let's see. Hmm. Let's give them a way that comparison can pop up in their face every single day. And then let's connect a camera to it so that they can compete. Think that through. Jen and I don't let our girls do cell phones or social media. And, and we've, been, we've given a lot of flack over, over the years, and, and people are like, yeah, but this, and yeah, but that. I, I, I need you to hear something. Ladies, this is, this is a, a, a real thing for the adults for us to consider. How much, how much time am I spending in this, in this world? 
because it's not real. And here, here's the other. Listen, we have a rule in our house. No selfies. That's, that's a rule in our house. And partly because now the research is coming out, there are some people that have gone to the place where they've actually labeled selfies as a mental disorder. Listen, listen, and hear this before you push back too much. If you post something that's filtered and you get a bunch of likes, what happens subconsciously inside of you? Well, I got a bunch of likes, but I had to have a filter, which must mean I'm not good enough without the... Do you, do you see, the, do you see the, the wrestle and the struggle there? And so let me challenge you with the selfie thing. Let me, let, me, let me challenge you to consider that this is something I believe that's fake and it's filtered, right? Because nobody gets up at 6 o'clock in the morning with a big glob of clear sill on their forehead, you know, just chilling, yo, woman crush Wednesday. You know, like nobody does that kind of thing. What they do instead is they, you know, primp and do all this filter and then go, oh, just sitting around, uh, right? This, this, this is fake, right? And, 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 and an untrue image of oneself will always lead to discontentment and insecurity. Always, always, always. Be honest about where you are. You don't have to fake it. If you're struggling with doubt, then just say it. If you have addiction, just say it. We're not afraid of your brokenness. We're not. And, 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 and we're happy to share you some of ours. Because what we feel like is, is if, if, if we'll get real, and especially here at our church where we have the ability to, to, to decide how to do things, if we'll get real with each other and say, this is where I am, and stop comparison and st- and, and, and the comparison game and stop the competing, and be honest, we can all go on this journey together to be a little bit healthier. Amen? That, that we would pull away this fake madness. It's got to stop. It, it, it is... It leads to discontentment and insecurity, which then finds itself in something called fantasizing. Right? Fantasizing about a different color hair or skin or a different size waist or chest or a different husband or boyfriend, which will always lead to the next place, coveting and jealousy. You see the cycle, right? So I do this comparison game. I don't feel good about myself. It leads me to fantasizing about what I could do or should have or this and that. And that leads to coveting and jealousy and all this struggle. What's interesting in the way that men and women women do this thing differently, men deal differently with like coveting and jealousy sort of thing. Males will often use their size and their strength to intimidate, right? You ever heard of little man's complex? You know what I'm talking about? Right? So, so what happens is, 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 a, is a man will kind of be like, say something. Say, uh, go ahead. I dare you say something. And that's kind of the way that a man deals with that situation. Yeah, but, but we don't tend to operate like that. Right. Uh, we use words. We can, with our words, be very nurturing and we can make things grow and flourish. Or, like some cruel ninja, we, with our words, we can burn everything to the ground. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I can I jump in real yes. quick there and say this? Listen to me. The most powerful words, your husband or the significant males in your, in, in your life, the most significant words they hear are the words that come from you. You have to hear the, the amount of power that that holds, right? Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. And not just our words, but our attitudes yeah. uh, can be brutal if we're not careful. We can be very cruel if we have those disordered desires that lead to, you know, coveting and jealousy and fantasizing. Like, and speaking of cruel words, let's talk gossip. You know, that's something women, we struggle with. But we need to open our Bibles and see that God hates gossip. Yes, he hates does. slander. He will not have it in his church. Not even disguised as prayer requests, y'all. Okay. <laughs> But we have to ask ourselves, who the heck do we think we are that we stand in a position that we could gossip or slander anyone? How highly do we view ourselves? Mm. How insecure are you that you would judge others and where they are? My mom just said this week, because my sister's having some women problems at work, you know, they're being catty. My mom just said, the more insecure they are, the harder they bite. Aren't we all where we are are by the grace of God? Yes. Are we so perfect in how we're living our life? 
Is your life so pretty that you literally have the right to sit and judge other women? Go ahead. Who do we think we are? You know, it takes some kind of prima donna, self-absorbed, insecure women that would stand in that spot and mm. cast judgment on others. And mm. you know you did it in just 30 minutes ago. I caught myself looking at somebody and going, is she crazy wearing that up here in the church? I like to slap myself. Who am I? Is my life so perfect? Does my sin not reek of death just like your sin? I got no, I got no place to cast judgment on any other woman. That's something we need to work on. I'm glad I'm a man because all the women are like, did I dress a perfect? Anyway. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> but no, but seriously, that's, some of you did because of exactly what we're talking about. Because because we're so consumed with, is everything okay in comparison? And we're about to get to the next step of why that is. But before we jump forward, let, let's talk about restoring. Let's talk about restoration. How do we deal with this? All right. And I honestly think there's one thing that you can do that can begin to help you to deal, ladies, with this comparison thing. And it's this. Restoration happens by pursuing purpose. Here's what I mean by that. If I pursue my, my, the purpose for my kids, I will overcome the mommy wars because I don't need to compare them to the other kids. What is their purpose? Why are they wired the way they are? Right? I don't have time if I'm pushing my kids forward towards the, what they're going to do. It doesn't matter that they're not doing what somebody else is doing because it's about purpose. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? We don't, we don't have time to. If I'm pursuing a purpose for my marriage, listen to me. The reason that you're probably whining and complaining about your marriage is because y'all don't know what your purpose is. And if I'm pursuing that purpose, you can overcome the fantasizing. You can overcome that scenario. What is it? And I dare you to consider as a couple to go. Where are we going? What are we trying to do? You know, I do this thing with Jen, and she, she has always hated it when we were running. I'd be like, okay, here we go. And she's like, oh, not again. And I'm like, five years, where do you see us? Where do you see us in five years? Girls will be this old. What are we doing? Like what, pursuing purpose, right? Because I can, we can, it's not like guys don't ever compare. It's just not our main sin bucket. But I can do that comparison thing too. And I can look at somebody else and go, well, they're doing this, and maybe my kids should be doing that. And, maybe you and now I'm off, I'm off purpose. Do you hear that? I'm completely off purpose because all I'm trying to do is keep up with the Joneses. Yeah, and instead of that. So pursue purpose for your life. If you'll pursue purpose for your life, I think you can overcome selfies and the need to compete. The need for this affirmation, this, this continual struggle, because you have a great, immense purpose inside of you. It, let me say this. I'm going to tread out on some thin ice for a moment. So Megan Rapinoe has become a huge name in our culture right now, right? The women's soccer team, all this argument. Now her beef is kind of the racism thing and she did the whole Kaepernick, you know, thing with the national anthem. But a lot of what you see coming out and right now, I don't know if you know this, but the women don't get paid what the men get paid for the World Cup. So there's this big inequality cry. So the Senate has, has introduced a bill that the Senate, the government, is going to pay the women the difference so that they get the same amount of money until the U.S. Soccer Association steps up and does that scenario. Here's the problem. Here's the question. How much money do the men's games bring in as compared to the women's games? The reason they get paid the way they get paid is revenue. It's simply revenue. If you go to work and your job is not producing, you don't get paid as much. Right? And so, but we make it this battle. But hear this there is an empowering that needs to happen to our, within our women. And it's a, an empowering for, yes, for us to get out, under, out from under this idea of helper, right? Concept, right? As opposed to, no, 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 no. She's my Azer. She's my warrior that stands beside me. She's the one that leads PMS moments and all kinds of other great things like that, right? And so there is an empowering that has to happen, but it's going to come when you pursue purpose. What is it that God has for purpose? You don't work where you work because you think you work there. Some of you think you live in Leesburg because you got a divorce and had to come home. Some of you think you live in Leesburg because you're like, I've been trying to get out of here forever and I just can't get out of here. The rest of my life, just going to be a chicken slinger or whatever. 
Listen to me. There is purpose and reason that you are in this place for such a time as this. I don't know how many people looked at me and said, Pastor Mike, you're going to launch a church in Leesburg. Really? Like, go to Claremont. Go out where they're bringing the new 492 in over there by like Sorrento, Mount Dora area. There's growth, there's people, all this kind of stuff. You know what? I could have done the best business model. Are you hearing what I'm saying? More people, more young professionals, probably more dollars, all those things, that would have been best business practice. But God said a long time ago, hey, Mike, your purpose is to serve Leesburg. So when you pursue purpose, you stop comparing. Comparison's number one. Let's talk about bucket number two, ladies. Perfectionism. Perfectionism. Perfectionism is the disordered desire for righteousness and perfection apart from Christ. It's the disordered desire for righteousness and, 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 and perfection apart from Christ. Let me read you from another article. All these articles, by the way, that we've picked are secular writers. And, and, we, and we sort of did that purposefully because we don't want it to just be Christianese. I want you to hear this is universal. You know what I mean? In, in the way these things go. So this is from The Atlantic. And it was from an article called Closing the Confidence Gap. Love, love this. Here's the opening first sentence. Underqualified and underprepared men don't think twice about leaning in, about getting into an opportunity. You catch that? In other words, a man who is underqualified, he's not qualified to do it. He's not prepared. He didn't prep at all, but he wants a shot at it. Like, that's the man thing. Like, we all do that. Like, the empirical data says, if Mike goes to work for this company, he's going to sink the company. But I want a shot. Like, that's that's the way a man thinks, right? We we think, come on, I got this. And the article goes on to say, yet overqualified and overprepared women still hold back. Women feel confident only when they are perfect or practically perfect. Study after study has shown that perfectionism is largely a female issue and one that extends through women's entire lives. <laughs> we, don't, we don't answer questions unless we are totally sure of the answer. We don't submit a report until we've gone over it a hundred times. We don't play wiffle ball at family game night because we think we won't be good at it. Sorry. My friends, I had to call you out, calling myself out of that one too. Y'all didn't play last week because... No, and we actually said, I'd do it if I thought I'd be good at it. Hello. Okay. (laughs) I know, but anyway. Um, But we do fixate on performance at home, at school, at work, at Zumba class. Yeah, you know who I'm calling you out. (laughs) Uh, Even on vacation, uh, we obsess. We obsess as mothers, as wives, as sisters, as friends, as cook. Perfectionism is definitely a female sport. Men don't don't play that game. No, man. I'm I'm like, I, yeah. It'll, you can't do that. Yeah, I can. Come on. You can't even read. Give me the book. Uh, it's upside down. Right. I, I knew it was upside down. I was I was just testing you. I mean, that's that's the way I mean. I got this. Like, we will jump forward and and do that. Um, that that's just how we work. But not so with women. No, women. We actually put a weight on our shoulders that is impossible to bear. Yeah. We have to be a perfect student. We have to be perfect at work. We have to be a perfect wife. We have to be a perfect friend. But where perfection is not obtained, we can become paralyzed. And it works itself out in our relationships like this. When perfection is your goal, any type of difficult in your any type of conflict in your relationships can be very, very difficult. So you will rarely, if ever, stand on what you believe to be true because you're just trying to keep the peace. You're trying to make everything perfect. So, but if we do that, we're gonna be shaped by the conscience of the people around us and we'll absorb their convictions. But we can't live out God's truth and please everybody. It's, it's, you can't do both. No, yeah. it's, it's not. We can't be perfect. Right. And not to mention mommy guilt, in this environment where raising kids has become a competitive sport, <laughs> not only is comparison a major issue that harms the children, but then the feelings of moms to be perfect dumped on top of that, it's maddening. Yeah. And I can tell you this, when I was a kid, 
Not everybody got a trophy. Amen. We drank out of the water hose, Amen. Of the garden hose. Uh, we ran the neighborhood barefoot. Yes. My parents gave everybody permission to spank Whoop us. Whoop your butt. Yeah. That's right. Everyone. Yes. And it was just a different world then. But now under this weight of perfection, there's this weird cultural idea, and they call it psychological determinism. This is when parents believe that the children they have are blank slates, that they can turn them into anything they want to using their parenting techniques. So I can turn these kids, I can make them stay away from drugs, I can make them stay away from alcohol, I can make my kids stay a virgin until they get married, and that is just not true. Train up a child in the way that they shall go, and when they get older, we will not, they will not depart from it. We've bastardized that verse. We have. Because you don't have the power to make sure your kid is godly. You don't. And you don't have the responsibility. What you have the responsibility to do is to provide your ch child an environment where they have every opportunity to come to know Jesus and pursue the destiny and purpose that God has for them. But I personally believe you got horrible parents that get phenomenal results. And you got phenomenal parents that get horrible results. Because there's a reality of a child's free will, right? Listen to me, it's absurd to have that kind of pressure on top of you. So let me try to free you. Christian parenting techniques produces godly children. That's categorically false. It could possibly produce godly children. I used to teach a parenting class, and what I used to say to them is, if you have provided an environment where your child has every opportunity to come to know who Jesus is, and then to fulfill that purpose, you are a successful parent, period. We, we, you you got to take that, that pressure off, that, that this thing that, that listen, <laughs> you're going to snap at your kids. It's going to be okay. You're, you're going to lose your patience with them. They're not going to be a serial killer. Right? And yet there's this, this perfectionism thing that, that, that brutalizes women. So let me give you a quote from Lynn Hirschberger. Here's another quote of somebody outside of the church world. She's the managing editor of W Magazine. She's also a pretty big, um, she's pretty big in Hollywood as a casting agent, okay? But she wrote this. Here's what she said. Catch this. I have an iron will, and all of my will has been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. Again and again, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's what's always pushing me and pushing me. Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove I'm somebody. My struggle has never ended and probably never will. Ladies... This is perfectionist. I, I can't be mediocre. I, I, even if I prove myself, then I've got to prove that I'm still somebody. This is why women are twice as likely to commit suicide. This is why women wrestle with anxiety and depression way more than men do. This is why mostly uh, it is women who struggle or are owned, overwhelmed with body image issues. How can you ever be happy if everything has to be perfect? How, how can you ever rest? Right? How can you ever feel at peace? How could you ever see yourself as lovely if perfection is your standard? Every holiday, every outing, every vacation, every interaction with your children, every day of your life, the oppressive, brutal weight of perfection on your back, ladies, stop. You are not perfect. It's okay. Take a deep breath. The gospel is not that you have to be perfect. 
the gospel is that Jesus will give you his perfection. If you will not rest in men or the things of this world, but you will find your rest in who he is. Yeah, you don't have to be a perfect wife to be a great wife. That's right. You don't have to be a perfect mom to be a great mom. That's right. And like he was saying, because you're like, well, where is that line? That line is confession. So when you screw up, admit it. Yep. Repentance. Go apologize for it and then get back up and keep moving. Yes. Uh, we take the perfection that is ma- made available through Jesus Christ. We That's take right. on his perfection. We take on that righteousness that came through Jesus Christ, not our own strength, uh, not our own righteousness, not my perfection, his perfection. And we rest in that. And then we walk as best we can every day. So where we do fall short and snap at our husbands, because no. that is happening. Right. Where we lose patience with our kids, because that is definitely happening. <laughs> when we find ourselves gossiping, when we find ourselves hurting ourselves, because we lack perfection or punishing ourselves. Confess, repent, get back up and keep moving. Yeah, it's, it's, it's women who self-mutilate way more than men. And our heart this morning is to see you release some of this. Our, our heart this morning is for you to breathe, like breathe, take a breath. And don't find your rest in things of this world or in a man. But find your rest in your Heavenly Father and the perfection that He gives you, right? The the two buckets we talked about today, one, disordered desire that takes place when we compare. Or the disordered desire that takes place when we believe that we have to be perfect. Those two enslave and brutalize the female soul. Take what is lovely and make it reek of death. This is why we joke about women being catty, right? I mean, everything that we just described to you is that scenario. I'm, I'm, I'm going to summer camp next week with the teenagers. And I already know, like I'm going to deal with some, some drama, 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 right? And most likely it's going to be in the girl cabins, not the guy cabins. Why? Because of what we just talked about. The most devastating, listen to me, the most devastating reality is this, that what we lust after ends up dominating us, enslaving us, and having dominion over us. One last quote, Thomas Chalmers. The expulsive power of new affection is the name of the, the, the article, but it says this. Where desires are distorted and broken, the only thing that can drive out desire is new desire. What does the scripture say? Renew your mind, right? That, that we renew our minds, that we take out old thought patterns and we put new thought patterns in. That's how we win this, this battle. But he, he goes on, uh, take out new desires and that we have more power, that they have more power than the old desires. If only we could have a new desire placed in our heart that has more power than the comparison and more power than the perfection. That's my challenge for you today. To put some affection in your heart that is more powerful than comparison and perfection. And I think the restoration, how do you restore perfectionism? Number one, you got to use it to remind you who is in charge. Because come on, when you're walking through the perfectionist world, you're in charge, right? You're not in charge. Your heavenly father's in charge and he's got it all right here in the palm of his hand and he has total control. So what do you do? Well, you continue to pursue purpose. What is it that God wants me to do not compared to everyone else? And the second one is use it to drive you to God. So ladies, let me say this one to you because it's so, so important. And guys, this goes for all of us, really. Your imperfection is an amazing blessing. It is. It's an amazing blessing. Because let me ask you something. If everything went perfect this week, how many times would you talk to God? I'm going to bet zero. It is our imperfection 
that reminds us of who our Heavenly Father is. It is our imperfection that reminds us of who our source is. It is our imperfection that reminds us that all things come from above, that He is the source of life and all. And when we turn our hearts and our minds back to Him, back to what He has for us, all the other things we sing, all the things of this earth become strangely dim in the light of His glorious grace, right? That we used to sing the old song. And so, so let, me, let me just challenge us all. All of humanity, male, female, we all struggle with these, this to an extent. Whatever desire controls our heart will control your life. Whatever controls is our Lord. If you seek power, you're controlled by power. If you seek acceptance, you're controlled by those that you seek acceptance from. See, we really don't control ourselves. We don't like that statement, but we don't. We control whatever we put up on a high pedestal. I mean, it controls us. We are controlled by things that we put up on a high pedestal. So let me ask everyone this morning this question. What is your Lord? What's your Lord? What consumed you this week? Is it in the comparison perfectionism thing, ladies? How about this, guys? Is it in the selfish passivity or selfish aggression? Were you overly aggressive in your, beha- in your behaviors this week? Or were you more passive and you walked away from your responsibility? Because those become what drive us. And so I challenge everybody here today. And I'm going to pray specifically for the ladies today because, man, I'm praying breakthrough for you ladies today. I'm praying that God speaks to you. I'm praying so much that you feel some some release today because I I have to say this. I almost said it earlier and the Holy Spirit just brought it back to me, so I have to say it. Ladies, a lot of your struggles in your marriage and this drive to nag this drive to push, this drive to fix, this drive. We just described it. Do you, you hear what I'm saying to you? Like you're, you're going to be a better Azar. You're going to be a better helpmate. You're going to be a better in, in your relationship. If you become okay with where you are, if, if you get out of the comparison cycle and you get out of this perfectionism cycle, it's going to be healthier for your home. It's, 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 it's going to be so much healthier for your relationship so what is it? What is your what is what is Lord? What is controlling? What is it that dominates you? And let me pray that through right now for you. Let's, let's bow our heads, close your eyes for a second. Father God, I, I thank you for this time. And and man, I pray, I specifically pray right now for our women, as I know some of them might be really tender right now. We may have really just touched some some stuff. And so I pray, God, that you would meet them in that place. You would give them peace, that they would fight perfectionism in this, this need now to fix and change and do. Would you break strongholds in hearts this morning? Holy Spirit, would you do what only you can do and break chains and bring revelation of areas where we can begin to change our affections and put in your thought patterns for our life and pursue purpose and have these things drive us towards you. And so I pray that over each of our ladies here today. Father, I pray for our marriages. When marriage is under such attack in our culture today, boy, strengthen us, God, to understand the roles you have given us, this beautiful design, this amazing design that you have given. And Father, for anybody here today who who's never known you as Lord. They've, they, they realize today that they've always put other things, whether it be addictions or whether it be people or comparison, perfection. I just want to pray a simple prayer. And, and, and if that's you today, you might pray something like this. Jesus, today, I acknowledge you as Lord for the very first time. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, come into my life and be my Lord. Lead me, guide me, that I can be who you have called me to be. And for those that recognize that they need to put you back on your throne today, God, would you meet them in this place? 
We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.